Welcome back. Let's see how far we can get until the next fire alarm. <laughs> <clears throat> I hope it's not us causing this. Magically. Um, so where were we at? We were discussing string split. And we were specifically discussing why string split needs to put its results into lists. And the reason is that string split operates on potentially a large number of individual strings to split. And the result of every single split can be a vector of widely varying lengths. And the data structure to put elements with different lengths into an R, these are lists. But normally we don't want a list, especially in this case, we don't want a vector inside a list, but we, we specified our function to return a single vector. So we need to take the vector out of the list when we assign it. Something like that, there's, there's two different uh, options we have. <clears throat> One option is like this, to simply, as I've done in the vector example before, um, extract from the result for which we know that it's the list, the first list element, which is a vector. We might do this more explicitly. But I'll get back to the version that I've, that I've just written. But I'd, I'd just like to demonstrate to you what's going on here. <clears throat> so at first, We have a list of one element which contains a vector with three elements which have been split up. So if we then take this first element we get a plain vector. So this is the same thing as I've done before with an intermediate assignment to the variable temp, TMP. But as I said, we don't actually need that intermediate assignment. We can just do this. So string split and then attach the <clears throat> the uh, um, subsetting operator of the two square brackets and then assign the result. Sorry. I didn't understand exactly what is the double brackets. Yeah. What does it mean? The double brackets? Yeah. Well, double brackets subset a single element from some object that has more than one element. So we typically use these double brackets to get single elements out of lists. If we use just a single bracket, then we can extract ranges or multiple dimensions. But the double brackets don't work in that way. So then actually you are uh, extracting the, the line, one line. Because <coughs> right, so temp. Three elements is not three elements in the sequence. Temp yeah. contains yes. one line. Yeah. If I oper if I use string split and operate on temp yeah. and split on the lowercase g, yeah. the result is a list. Yeah. 
<coughs> I want the first element of that list, so I attach that operator to this expression. An alternative thing that I could have done is the following. And use the unlist function. So in this case, the unlist function does the same thing. But if my element would now contain more than one element to split, all of the resulting elements would go into the same vector. <clears throat> now, depending on the situation, what you expect and what you don't expect, uh, either one or the other is, is the better way um, to do this. If you want to be defensive in programming, after you generate a list, you can test that it indeed only contains one element, as expected. So if we look at length of this result here, it is one, not three. It's one vector that contains three elements, and the list is the top container. <clears throat> right? But if we unlist this, then everything just gets thrown together. Now, we could test for the length and throw an error if the length is not the expected length of one. For our code here, it, it really doesn't matter. We can. We can write this in either way. I think in this case I would I would do it this way. Right, but but we didn't want to split on G, right? We wanted to split this up into single characters. So how do we do that? <clears throat> Can you just put quotation marks? Okay. Right. So the idiom here is if we split on the empty string, the result is single characters. So string split temp on empty strings is a list, again. And if we unlist it or extract from the list, then we get, we finally get our single characters. And we assign our single characters to a variable v, and we return the result, and we're done. Yes, this, if we don't name the parameter, we can get the same result. OK, that's a good comment. What's this with naming characters and not naming characters? For this, 
Um, we need to consider how a function actually knows what value what a value is named that is that is passed as a function argument <clears throat> and that is information we find in the function signature so if we hover over say string split We get this little box here, which is the signature, i.e. it's the name, the parentheses, and the names of the arguments that we pass into the function. Now, we can, put, we can pass parameters into the function in two different ways, either by default position or by name, or mixed. By default position means if x is the pattern is is the pattern to split um, split is the pattern to split with fixed is whether we use um, fixed or variable bytes Perl is the dialect of the regular expressions to use and so on um, we can put all the expected parameters simply in that order and it will work But we can also change the order around if we name the parameters. So for example, I can say a string split temp empty string, and I will get this result. But I can also say split equals empty string, x equals temp, and turn it around. So if things are not in the right order, then you must name them. If things are in the default order, you can omit the name. Typically, what I end up doing is to omit the name for the first argument, if that argument is the input for a function, because it's just x or, or, or something, usually, internally. But I use names for the other parameters. And the reason is simply to make the code more explicit. It's easier to read if I know that you know, I'm not just passing an empty string and you know, what is, how, how do I remember the, the function signature? I'd need to look it up. And, that just wastes time. I can make it explicit and simply say split equals um, the empty string. So string split what? And then pass the parameter. I think this is relatively explicit. And then we return the result. Um, So let's see if it works <clears throat> in order to make the function known. We just execute this piece of code. Or we, in this case, since the file is laid out or constructed so that um, nothing untoward happens as if we execute the script, um, we can just source the whole thing. So I click on source, this sources the file, and now in my functions, I have a function called read fast a. And the signature is function of file name. Now I had defined fn as test.fast a to make sure that this global variable does not interfere with the local variable I deleted again. So that's <clears throat> one way, probably the, 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 the way um, I write most of my books is when I develop a function locally, define some variables with the names that are used in the functions, 
And then I run the function and I expect something to happen, but something else happens instead because the variable exists in two places, internally and, and externally. So it's a good idea to, to, to remove such variables um, that you've used for development when you don't need them anymore. So we remove file name. And now, sh now it should work. Let's try it. Um, so, um, read fast A, and the file name was uh, test dot fast A. There you go, one vector with single characters. Okay, so as a result of this, everybody should have a local function read fast A. If you don't, put up some red posts and we'll see how we can help. Um, yeah. What's happening instead? I'm not trying just this I think we just wrote a whole thing here. It's supposed to be easier to write. And when I did this, I didn't do mine. I was just trying to do it. I totally did it. So why do you think it doesn't work? Thank you, guys. Oh, it's going to be fast. So it doesn't work. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There's enough for. Oops. Ready. Lively. Lively. They're nice, right? I also have some for our second workshop. Boy, we're going to need many rubber ducks for that one. <laughs> Pick and choose. Have a squeaky rubber duck or a squishy thingy. Um, and use it for debugging. It's great. It actually works. Um, if if you don't if you don't have a rubber duck for debugging, you might have a significant other. It also helps to to explain the code. But if you know if all you do is talking about bugs in your code, I'm not sure how good that will be for the relationship. So rubber ducks. <clears throat> okay. Is everybody at that stage? Everybody has a function? No? Okay. Let's debug some more. Right. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You look good. All right. Then I just have to just come on. This is the one. Yeah.
you remove the one that he said? Uh, yeah, so we removed uh, uh, it's not it should. There's just a few extra things in here that you want to get rid of. Because it's automatically going to go check the military directory. Awesome. Okay. It's going to go look at where's the I'm just trying to write it down. Because when I read it, it's going to cross the room. Okay. Okay. Great, so we're taking oh, off yeah. the so yeah. yeah. so so here, so above this, is, is where you define the function, and then here you have a testing Yeah, that's just what I have. Like, like, what do you have follow up yeah, exactly. Right. Like, so, 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 no, no, so you just had some extra stuff prior that you want to just only have this line. Yeah. Okay, so there. So then, like, so, following any of the fast so you want it to only um, have one definition. I mean, it's going to return the last thing that was done. So I think it should be fixed. It just imports into it. 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 So that's the name of the function, and then this you can name the vector like and you have my uh, yeah. no, it's okay. so, and then that was just stored in that vector. Yeah, so we're just going to pull it out and make it automatically accessible as a vector. 
So, if I is it this name? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's oh. the, that, so once yeah. I like, so here, so it's my understanding, we can try to use the auto tab and just see what's there because it's in the file that you're telling it to read. So you want that guy. This is what I can do, but it's in Okay, so we just have to read it. Oh, I see. Okay, so we just have to name this into it. Yeah, so RM. That means remove. Uh, no, so it's removing this FN object that has been defined earlier. Um, Okay, <clears throat> so that's all good. Um, now, to finish this up, I'd like to have a usage example and a test here.
Now, the usage example can be very simple. So all you possibly would want to do is this here. But it wouldn't actually work because there's no guarantee that at the moment that you try the function possibly uh, under very different circumstances that the file test.fasta really still exists. So what we can do is we can create a little file and use that instead. Now when you create a file in the usage example or in a test, there's a problem. Because if you inadvertently choose a file name of something very important and very dear to your heart that you have in your local memory, and then you run your test with a file name that accidentally has the same file name, R will do the stubborn thing and overwrite it. And that may not be good. So to guard for that, R has a mechanism to generate files that exist only once, so-called temporary files, through the function temp file. So if I, <clears throat> if I run the function temp file without parameters, it gives me a long string of gibberish where it would create a file that is unique and exists only once and in only this place. So what I can do is create myself a file name. And now I can save to that file my little use case. So do something like um, write lines test and the right lines arguments require the text to write and a text connection. My file gets a file name, I write to that file name, and then I do read fast a my file. In this way, I can be sure if I try things and I experiment things, I don't accidentally overwrite precious files.
How long does that file exist? It exists until you next close your R session. So it's temporary. The system cleans up when you close your R session. Temporary files and directories are removed. Write lines is exactly the opposite of read lines. So write lines takes a vector of strings and writes that to a file line by line, each element in a line. Read lines takes a file of lines and reads in a vector of strings. So read lines and write lines are exact opposites. remind myself of how to actually use the function. Okay. Okay. So like what is the sorry and I know you said that, like the false indicator at the beginning and just the okay. if statement. The false indicator is so that this block does not get executed when the entire script is sourced. Okay. So the way that we, we use this function or that the way that we load this function later on is simply to source the entire file. And then this is a utility which becomes, which is a function which then exists in our workspace. However, you know, we can have some housekeeping functions here like examples or tests to make sure that the function actually uh, works as expected. And um, we wouldn't want to execute them every time we load the function. And this is why we put this in a block which kind of hides this from execution. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. It's not working. That's why I said it can't open the connection. It can't yeah, find anything called my file. No, so that one's perfect. So you're good. Yeah. 
Sorry. Okay, so this is so useful. This is good to have. But now how do we make sure we actually have it every time we run an R session, or at least an R session in our project? Well, there's several ways to do this. Um, often I put code which I need locally in a project in a file that I call utilities or tools and uh, just source that whenever I start uh, my code. But in this case, um, what I've done is I've constructed this little init.r function, or init.r script, so that local functions are sourced. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm listing all the files in the R directory. And for each script that I find in that R directory where the file name ends with .r, I source the script and I write a little bit of output that that script has been sourced. So if I take that function now and move it into the R directory, read fast a dot R. I select it, and I go on the More menu and move. And I choose the R folder and click on Open. First of all, RStudio uh, complains that the file that I had opened for editing no longer exists because I've moved it elsewhere. So I want to close it, that's okay. Now if I look into my R directory, read fast a dot R is now there. And now if I type in it, which I would do, whenever I open this project or I return to this project. It tells me initializing, sourcing local functions from the .r directory. One of the local functions is .r read .r. So once you have that, every time you open this project and you type in it, the function is defined and is known, and you can just use read fasta. Okay. Well, that's a major milestone. We've written the first function, not just ad hoc, but in a quite principled way. <clears throat> we've debugged it. We've talked about debugging. Um, I'm going to move ahead a little bit and um, actually not talk about testing right now. I'd like to get a little bit of, of actual work done. And we might talk about testing if we ever run into problems with our function here. So back to our sequence analysis tasks. The task 2.4 is actually read this file and assign it to my seek and confirm that this has worked. So you want to define a variable myseq and assign the result of your read fasta output of this 100,000 nucleotide 
uh, file and assign this to my seek. All right. Help me out here. What do I need to type? What would you type? Luciana. Well, you know, I, I first of all, I want to assign something to my seek, so I type my seek and assign, and then. My fast I, right? It's a function. Read fast A. And the function wants a file name. And the file name is this here. No, read faster is a function. Right, so we need to say run this function on that file and assign the results to my seek. Well, that did not generate an error. Now, how could we confirm that this has worked? Length. So the first question could be length. So let's see. Length my seek. 100,000. Is that what we expect? Is it? Not just one long string, 100,000 single characters. Exactly, that's what we wanted, right? OK. Um, are these all the characters that, that, we, that we were looking at? So um, let's look at the first few. How do we get the first few characters? Head and tail, yes. Head. My seek. A G T A G A. Is that correct? Is A G T A G A the the way our file ought to start? How do we know? You don't remember. So we'll have to look. How do we look? We just open the file. A G T A G A. Oh, I like that. That looks very good. So the next thing was uh, using tail, right? Tail my seek. A A A A A G G. Is that correct? Well, more of the same here. <clears throat> A, 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 G, G, OK. Also correct. Now, this actually checking your objects <coughs> and making sure that what you have in memory corresponds exactly to what you think you should have is good and sound practice. You should always make that a habit. In this business, data is holy. You really need to respect your data. Don't cut corners. Look at it, confirm it, validate it at every single opportunity. And as we go along and a little and try to work with it, um, you'll appreciate why this is kind of important. 
Wonderful. Now we can calculate the GC contents. We can actually do some analysis with it. What GC contents would we expect? 50-50? More? Less? What's, what's human average GC? Molecular biology 102. Well, we can calculate it. Uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can tell you. It's about 40%. OK. But how do we calculate the GC contents? So we have a 100,000 character vector. How do we calculate GC contents? What would you do? Count them and divide by 100,000. You would count them. How do we count them? Table. Hmm? Table. Table. You could match them against some kind of prototype like A, T, Gs, and Cs and see how many you get at each okay. function where it goes through the whole sequence. Okay. We can do that. Any other way? Count? In a, in a loop? We could do that too. Different strengths and weaknesses. Oh, let's just try them. I just write the code, and, and you don't need to write the code too, but you can see what's happening. So let's first run a console. You remember how a loop works in principle. So a typical for loop has for some variable that we're iterating over. And then doing something. The typical way we, we write an iterator like that is something like for i in the range of 1 to length of my seek. Count. So length my seek is 100,000. So this expands to 4i and 1 to 100,000. So <clears throat> we cycle through this loop. At the first iteration, i is 1. At the second iteration, i is 2, and so on. Let's initialize this by a variable that we call na, number of a's we find in the file and set that to 0. Then our count would work in this way, that we say if my
I seek I equals A. Then <coughs> NA becomes NA plus one. So that's really the most low level pedestrian way to do this. Now we could also have an N, C, G, and T, and we could have a number of if and else statements here and count this all together. But just running this like that, gives us 26,219 A's. Right? <clears throat> so that's possible. Sometimes the condition that we're looking for is very involved. Um, of course, just comparing one character against another character um, is, is not very difficult. We can have simpler and more vectorized and more efficient ways to do this. But for example, if you want to find out whether that A has two more A's within 10 nucleotides upstream or downstream, or whether that A is in a list of positions that are highly conserved, or you know whatever other conditions, then any of the other methods might fail, and you have to revert to this very pedestrian way of just looping over a vector and counting individual occurrences. So this is possible. Now, if you ever, like, ask on Stack Overflow um, about this kind of code, everybody would just tear their hair and say, no, 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 that's not how you write it in R. Usually it isn't, but there are special cases when that's exactly the right kind of idiom to pursue. But let's look at matching against a pattern and assessing the results. And that's kind of interesting. So let's work with a little smaller subset here, not with 100,000. I'm going to define a vector of, say, the first um, 20 nucleotides from my seek. <coughs> right, so the first 20 nucleotides. And This is a vector, and we can compare the vector with values. So you can say x equals a. What's the result of evaluating this expression? Well, this is the binary operator, the equals operator. Um, it's in the same class as less than, greater than, not equal to, <clears throat> and so on. And the result of this binary operator of a vector and something else is always a vector of Boolean values, true or false. So 1 equals 1 is true and 1 equals 2 is false. So that's for scalars. But for vectors, the way this works is the comparison is done for every element in the vector. So true, false, false, true, false, true, false, and so on. So this is the result of that. This is a vector of Boolean values, trues and falses. And now there's a kind of a trick, an R idiom, that we can use to count how many trues we have in there. And that depends on casting data types from logical values to numeric values. If we cast 
true to numeric, we get 1. If we cast false to numeric, we get 0. So by treating this string as a numeric string instead of a Boolean string, it gets converted into a sequence of ones and zeros. And some functions in R do such kinds of conversions implicitly. And one of these functions is sum. So sum wants to sum over numbers. So it takes whatever it gets and tries to convert that into numbers. If we give it Booleans, it converts the Booleans silently to numeric values and then sums over ones and zeros. The end effect of this is that the result of sum of x equals a, or that Boolean vector, is the number of trues in that sequence of logicals. So once again, x is equal to a had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 trues. And if we sum over these 5 trues in a longer vector, the result is 5. <clears throat> now this is one of the rare cases where something is um, quite idiomatic. I don't think you could write this in the same way explicitly in Python or in some other language. In R you can do this. But it's so concise and so useful and used so often that this is one of the things you just learn to recognize and understand. If you see sum over some evaluation of a conditional, you know what you're actually doing is you're counting the number of truths. This, in principle, <coughs> gives us the GC contents. In this case, it just happens to be 0.5. That's, that's just how it com turns out to be. So. Could we do the same thing for MySeq? Sure. So the result of the GC contents here in this case is 0.47681. Now having to write this separately for C and G is, is a little bit awkward. So I'm going to use the same approach but with a different function which is called grep which is one of the most useful functions in your R toolkit. Grep, I think um, the, it's an, it's, it's an uh, portmanteau for group representation. Um, it asks for a pattern and some X it works on. <clears throat> So 
So if I grep for C's in my X, I get two numbers, and that's the position 18 and 20. So this means the element 18 and element 20 in my, in my, in my vector are C. Now the cool thing about the pattern is this can actually be a regular expression. So we can put fancy things in there. So for example, a regular expression for saying, give me either G or C, is written in this way. This is called a character class expression. Everything that is within these square brackets is matched. So what this says is, show me the positions of something that is either C or G in my vector x. And this is this. Now we could either use length of this vector for counting, or we can use a variant of grep, which does the same thing, but returns booleans, which is grep L, grep logical. Prep logical gives me again a vector of trues and falses. <clears throat> and um, I can sum over that to give me the expected result. Right, applying this to my seek, grep logical CG in my seek divided by the length of my seek gives me 0.47681 as above. So we have a strategy of using counting by explicit loops. We have a strategy of comparing in a vectorized expression with either grep or with um, equal sign and summing over the results. But someone mentioned what I think is probably the preferred way to work with this, and that's the function table. Now, table goes through a vector, finds everything that's unique in that vector, and then tells us how often this unique thing occurred in the vector. And that's something that is supremely useful. So let's have a quick look. Table x. <clears throat> so table X, we'll analyze this in a little more detail in a moment, essentially tells us we have five A's, two C's, eight G's, and five T's. Now that's kind of nice to look at it, but of course we want to work with it. So we need to understand a little better what this table object actually is that gets returned. So let's assign
the result to a variable. And let's look at the structure. <clears throat> so in principle, this is a named vector. It's an object of class table, which is internally recognized to be in a, in a particular, or organized in a particular way. The values are integers. And each of the integers, i.e. elements in a vector, have a name attached to it. This is why it's a named vector. And the names are A, C, G, and T in that order. So since these are integers, I can do things like summing over them, which is 20. Telling me what the most frequently observed character is, the maximum, which is 8. Or the minimum, which is 2. So I can do computations with this. But I can also pull out the individual values that I'm looking for. And this is because these are names of elements, and that is one of the fundamental ways in which we can access our objects. Remember, we can access them with indices. A positive index will return us an element of, of one thing. A range will return us many elements. A negative element will remove that uh, from the output, and so on. We can access vectors with logicals for every position of true that vector is returned, or we can access vectors by their names or row names or column names if, if it's a more dimensional object. <clears throat> so my tab A returns the element from the table output that is named A, and that is 5. My tab of a vector of names, which are A and T, gives us two results here. A and T are both 5. My tab G and C gives us 8 and 2. Note that this is not the same order in which they existed in the table. Like I'm getting G first and then C. Whatever the row, row names are, if I specify them, I'm, I'm getting them back here. So it doesn't have to be unique. This is one, one of the ways of, of uh, subsetting a vector with row names or names. <clears throat> so to write an expression to calculate GC values with a table, I could do something like
table my seek, then subset that result to the elements named G and C, then sum over the values, then divide them by the length. So table my seek is this. Subsetting the table is only these two values. Summing over these two values is Let me just mention this because it just appeared. Um, I didn't select the closing bracket when I executed this. And now my console has this plus sign. That's probably happened to you uh, from time to time. Um, so whenever I hit return, I get only a plus sign, and it's waiting for me to do something. In this case, I know that I need to close um, a round bracket, but sometimes, you know, I'm executing a complicated function, I don't know, is it a round bracket it's missing, or a square bracket, or uh, a curly brace, or whatever. So to get out of this, I just hit escape. So the escape character puts me back to the command line. OK, so let's select it properly. <clears throat> 47,681, which of course divided by the length, is the same result. So three different strategies of calculating GC contents. One explicitly, slowly, in a very pedestrian way, but also in a way that allows us to be the most flexible in selecting the situation that we actually want to count by iterating over loops and evaluating some condition within the loop. Number two is comparing against the pattern, and number three is using the table function. The table function would be the one that might be most useful in validating our assumptions over the file. For example, um, if we simply count how often we have a G and C uppercase, we might not notice if our, if our um, if our sequence file contains lower, lowercase characters. And we might erroneously not count them. But if we use the table function, we might immediately see that we don't get four categories, but we get eight categories. Right? In this case, since we've done table, and we've seen A, C, G, and T, and these are the only ones, this means there is no other character in our file. Incidentally, that's a that's a decent way to validate that your input file only has the expected characters. O point forty seven is this value expected? What's the human average? I didn't know that. I googled that um, when I designed this unit. Um, what do you think? What does Google tell you about what's the expected GC contents in human genome? What do we know about GC contents? Come here. What do we know about GC contents in the genomes? In genomes, um, it's, uh, I know it can be an accuracy issue for our AC. Um, yeah. But in terms of average amount, I think maybe 48, 49%. I think it's a little bit less than. Uh, what does Google say? Sure. 
We're not sure. <coughs> because most of the sequencing data hides the two American and two American regions where GC content is high. Oh, we have regions where GC content is high. So it's not variable throughout. We have tracts where it's high and tracts where it's low. <coughs> so it's not randomly distributed. This is why it's actually not so easy to find an answer because you know if you Google for it, the answer is it kind of depends on where you're looking. I vaguely remember after spending more time than I wanted to, but in an interesting way, um, I came up with, with an idea that it should be on average around 20%. Um, which is less than what we have here, but that there are regions where GC contents is much higher and regions where GC contents is much lower. So that's kind of interesting. Can we? What's the situation here? Can we find out what our local GC contents looks like? We should, right? We have we have the data here, so we can analyze it. Let's look at our local GC contents. So GC contents as a function of position in our nucleotides. All right. That requires strategy. The task is find and display. GC contents as a function of position in these 100,000 nucleotides. How do we define this step by step? So, do you want to start by breaking your 100K sequence into smaller blocks? Okay. Well, actually, I can, I can just write that down. Here. So, break sequence into blocks. And then we go and have a beer. <laughs> you know, co coding R, defining coding R as a drinking game would actually be a lot of fun. <laughs> Because you have to have a lot of steps. I've once witnessed people uh, using a, a drinking game for The Bachelorette. Has anybody ever seen The Bachelorette? <laughs> so they had to drink whenever um, one of them said love, and it was like insane. Like it's never meant, but they, they use that word like millions of times. The worst was when they then decided they'd go with like. <laughs> um, so breaking sequence into blocks. We don't get to drink then, we need to do something more. Break the sequence into blocks. Then? Count the GC in each block. Okay. And then? Mm, right now, we've only calculated GC. We also need to store the result. And then? <laughs> OK, histogram. What does a histogram show you? For each block. So you would do a hundred or you know whatever the resolution is, a thousand histograms? Yeah. Oh no, I guess I meant like across you spread it across each block would represent like one value. Yeah. So you would then do a histogram 
and that would give you the distribution of GC values in the blocks. Well, that's, you know, no, 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 it wouldn't be very dark. We'll have a look at that, but it wouldn't be quite what we were looking for. But it's also an interesting way to analyze the data, so we'll definitely do that. Um, no, what I would do is plot the value by block position. So from the first block to the second block, from the third block, and so on. So let's just remember the histograms. <clears throat> okay. Right. So can you do this? Of course you can. You have a little duck to help you. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> we can actually break the sequence into blocks by subsetting. You know, 1 to 100, 101 to 200, 201 to 300, and so on, and subset it that way. Um, we don't need to do that because it's all just copying the same sequence data f into different positions. So we can just keep the sequence in place and take the histogram for a range from you know, one position to another position to another position. The advantage for keeping the histogram in place and just adjusting our positions is, in principle, we could have overlapping regions. Rather than you know, just splitting it up, we could say a window of 2,000 values centered on the middle and doing that in um, you know, 500 base pair increments, something like that. That would be a kind of a smoothed average. But in in order to do any of that, I would start out by defining myself a vector of indices. Um, and for that, something that's really useful is a function called sequence. Now, in our world, it's a bit unfortunate that our so useful variable name sequence is already occupied by an R function, which might lead to complications. But just remember, sequence in this context means give me a sequence of values. And it's very versatile. Sequence is also one of the things you need again and again and again. So there's two, two, well, several principal ways of using sequence. So <clears throat> we could have a sequence of 1 to 10 in increments. Oh, well, well, let's go slow. Sequence of 1 to. Uh, what? Sorry. What am I doing? Not sequence, it's seek. So seek of 1 to 10 just gives me 10 values. Well, you'd say, well, you know, what's good about that? We can just use the colon operator and get the same thing. Sequence is more versatile, though. So I can say seek 1 to 10 by equals 3. And that increments by 3 every single time. 1 plus 3 is 4. 4 plus 3 is 7. 7 plus 3 is 10. Or if by equals 4, we have 1, 5, 9. 
So that guarantees that the last value is always still contained in the sequence. So the last value here is not 13, but 9. The maximum value is 10. But we can also <clears throat> use smaller values. So in this case, I will get floating point values of whatever. Um, a second very, very useful argument to this is length out. And that tells me if we have a sequence of equally spaced numbers, um, what should the output length be? So for example, if we say length out is 7, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 numbers where the minimum is 1, the maximum is 10, and the values in between are equally spaced by 1.5. Or if it's 13, we want, we get some different odd values. Somewhere in between. So if we want a vector of indices, um, that we want to compute with. Um, we could write a sequence, well, something like this. Index to start with. Now, how many blocks would we want? What's useful? 100? 100 sounds good. 200? 300? 1,000? We, we might want to play around with it, right? So let's just, you know, to do this well is let's write this in a way where we don't really need to commit ourselves. We just assign a value of n. And then we don't hard code numbers, but we make everything so that it's relative to our n. OK, so <clears throat> the first index is 1. The last index is the length of my c. by equals n. So we get blocks of n plus n plus n, 100 and 100 again. And Hang on. No, you said length out is, sorry. OK. So this gives us a, a hundred um, blocks of that size. Now, there's a there's a thing about that which you can probably appreciate, um, and that is <clears throat> um, if our length out is such that what sequence returns are not integers, but floating point values we'll get an error when we try to use them as indices into our vector. So we need to do some kind of rounding.
There are three <coughs> common rounding functions in R. One is called round, and that rounds in the way that you would expect. One is called floor, which simply takes the integer portion and drops um, the everything after the decimal. And one is called ceiling, which um, does the same thing but adds one to the result. So when we do this kind of thing, we want to make sure that we don't actually exceed our um, our blocks. Um, so we'll take the floor rounding in this case. <clears throat> so with 100, it wouldn't apply because we do get integers. But if we have 311, that might be different. All right. Now we have 100 blocks. Um, as indexes. So, yeah, let's write a loop. So I need my i to return each of these values in, in, uh, in sequence. So since idx is a vector, I can simply use that vector here. <coughs> I don't need to iterate over the length of it and then pull out and subset it one by one. I can simply place that. and make sure that that's what I want. There's a problem here because I can I, I can immediately appreciate that I can write something that goes from the first to the second, from the second to the third, and so on. But how do we know that we've that we've that we've left over at the end? Um,
So one way to do this is to actually not iterate over IDX, but iterate only over the first values of um, Yeah, let's do this explicitly. Um, <clears throat> let's use these in principle, but in a, in, a, in a somewhat different way. Let's define two index vectors. Um, call one i from, and say this is i dx, but not the last element. The second one is I2, and this is IDX, but not the first element. Right? And then I can simply define my block as going from I from to I2, and they're all contained in my sequence. I think that's a very nice explicit way to do it. So now we go for i in i from. in length i from because we need to apply it to both. My sequence is my seek i from i i to So this is from 1 to 99. For i in every element of this, my sequence is this range here. So let's see if this is kind of correct. Let's say i is whatever, 7. Then the range of i from i is a thousand characters here and subsetting my sequence is a large number of characters. Good. Now we need to calculate the GC of S. I'm using one of the variants here. But I need to store the result. So how do I store the result? Well, <clears throat> I initialize a vector of results.
is a vector of numbers of this length. So when we run counting loops or ana analysis loops and store the results somewhere, we should try to be um, really, really careful not to grow our results lists dynamically. So what I could do is I can just initialize my results as a vector, and then I can say, assign this to vector position 1, assign this to position 2, assign this to position 3, and the vector grows dynamically as I assign to positions that the vector doesn't even have in the beginning. So a small vector goes into a large vector until all my results are done. But this is one of the computationally most expensive things that you can do in R because it requires a lot of memory management. So when R generates a variable, it allocates a little bit of the computer memory for that variable. When that variable then dynamically grows, it has to allocate enough for the larger by negotiating with the operating system to, to um, allocate space that we can fit the larger object into. Then we have to copy the old results to the new space. Then we have to add our new result. And then we have to free the memory for the old result because we don't need that space anymore. So there's a lot of copying and negotiation going on. And this makes the process convenient but supremely slow. So whenever you can avoid that, code gets to be like, you know, at least 10 times faster. And this thing of dynamically growing results is the primary reason of why sometimes code is too slow to be working with, especially when you're doing you know, genome scale analysis, where you want to look at something 100 times. Don't grow the results. If at all possible, figure out before you run the analysis how large the result is going to be, and then pre-allocate the space. So our result is going to be as long as the vector i from. Because that's how we define our loop. We do something this many number of times. And for each of the times, we need one spot in our results vector. So that length, we need numeric values of that length, and we just call them GC profile. So this is now a vector of 99 elements, and each of the elements is 0. And as we now calculate, for i in one length i from, and so on, <clears throat> we store the result, and that is simply gc profile of i is this number here. So I remove the number here and <coughs> save it. OK, once again, for each starting block, we define the sequence we sum over the GC contents we divide by the length, and we store this in GC profile. So that's um, reasonably fast. 99 values here. So let's plot them. Plot GC profile.
Does that look correct? No. Right? That doesn't look correct. I think I need a rubber duck. Okay. <clears throat> well, the indices look right. values look right. That doesn't look right. Why do they end with 100,000? Let me redo this just to be sure. So IDX is a vector, 100 elements of that. Oh, I, here's my mistake. Length x. I didn't know what x was. But it's not what I want. I need length idx. I want to remove the last element. OK. That makes a difference. And I2 then <laughs> OK, and I can immediately see what happens. So x had the value of 20, so it started working until here. And then um, I removed the value, and that made our I from and I2 to be the same value. So that returns just a single nucleotide, which is either GC which then gives us for that single nucleotide a value of 1, or which is not GC, which gives us for that single nucleotide a value of 0. So this is why it was iterating. OK, so here was my mistake. So we need IDX minus length, IDX, of course, and IDX minus 1, GC profile, run it again, plot the GC profile. There we go. So note what this means. This means that we have regions in there where our GC contents approaches 1 over like 1,000 nucleotides. Is that actually true? Well, let's check that. So how do we find the coordinates that this maximum value here corresponds to? What would you do? What would you do? How do, how do you find the coordinates for this here? Go back to the vector and actually pull out the nucleotides. So where is this? So. GC profile oh, 
the maximum value is 0.778 in GC profile, almost 80%. Now, one thing that we often need is we need to look into a vector and identify where is that largest value. <clears throat> so, in principle, we look at a logical vector, GC profile equals to the maximum which gives us a vector of trues and falses. There's an expression, there's a function here, which given a vector of trues and falses, tells us where in the vector they are. And that's which. So this is an idiom we use a lot, which GC profile equals max GC profile, or which GC profile is min GC profile, or something like that. So which identifies the position in the vector of logicals? And that is position 76. So all we need to do is we need to retrieve the nucleotides from position 76 to position 76, that vector. That will give us 1,000 nucleotides. To make things a little bit more visible, I'll use the paste collapse thing. And there we go. So note that we don't actually have a lot of CGs. We have stretches of Cs and stretches of Gs. So the GC content is very high. But in terms of dinucleotides, that's going to be interesting. OK. So what we've done is we have prepared the 100,000 nucleotides that we've downloaded from Ensemble in a way that we can start analyzing things. And we've run a few simple analyses to start looking and quantitatively looking at features of our data here. One of the features was looking at GC contents. And we've calculated that globally as a value over our nucleotides. And we've also looked at how do we iterate over positions and then get positional information. And we've seen that the positional information of GC contents is not random but structured. There are stretches of DNA sequence that have significantly higher GC contents than the surrounding regions. These, as you know, are often uh, regulatory. Um, regions, regions that are important for uh, regulatory reasons. OK. Good time for a coffee break. After that, we'll look at the dinucleotide frequencies. Um, so I think I'm going to take a, this little code block and upload it on the project so you can download it after the coffee break for reference.